If you would open your Bibles to the book of Colossians in the New Testament. We're beginning a study today, verse by verse, through this letter to this group of Christians in this city, Colossae. How we get the title, the letter Paul to the Colossians. He was inspired to write some things to them, and I'll try to give a little bit more clarity about the circumstances surrounding this letter here in just a moment. But let me tell you a little bit about the town. Curtis Vaughn wrote a, a nice description of this particular area. Colossae was a small town. It was located about 100 miles east of Ephesus. Its nearest neighbors were two cities, one called Laodicea. You might remember that from one of the churches in the first part of Revelation. It was 10 miles away. And then another city, Hierapolis, 13 miles away. The traditional theory about this letter is the one still most generally held today is that Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote this letter. And so we have a date roughly for when it was written, about A.D. 62. So if you can try to put this in perspective, Paul was in a prison in Rome writing to this church about 30 years after the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. Okay? And according to John Salehammer, who's a great Bible scholar, actually one of the professors at the seminary where I attended, his concern, why, why did he feel the need to write this letter to these Christians at this area? His primary concern was the threat of false teachers. Now that's always a concern, right? It should be. We should always uh, keep a tight guard on the influences that are speaking into our lives, the teaching we're receiving, okay? But this particular letter was written out of a threat, a, a, a real imminent threat of false teaching with man-made philosophy, man-made religion, and the church had been founded on sound doctrine. But they needed some help. They needed to remember some things. More understanding, perhaps, on, on a few things. The supremacy of Christ, the true image of God, Christ's sacrificial death, and the power of His resurrection. So how fitting that we're at the Lord's table remembering the sacrifice of Christ. And that's one of the things that this particular church really needed to remember and understand more clearly. So before I say anything else, let me read the first eight verses of chapter 1 of Colossians. And we'll discuss some things in the time we have. And hopefully make some really clear application for our own lives. Here's what the Bible says. As Paul writes in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of which you previously heard in the word of truth. The gospel which has come to you. Just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who was a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will take this word. I pray you'll give us clear minds, open hearts. Help us understand. Help us obey the truth you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. So you might read these first eight verses by way of introduction and think, okay, well that sounds like a description. Doesn't sound like a whole lot of teaching going on in there. 
And perhaps to some degree you might be right, but let me just tell you a few things that we can see just in the introductory parts of this letter. Paul's primary purpose in writing this letter is to counteract the false teaching. That's what we talked about. And it had already started to infiltrate the ranks of the church. Vaughn writes again that he confronted the false representation, the false teaching that was happening by giving a positive teaching about Christ. So understand what that means. Paul didn't necessarily take what was taught falsely and attack it. He just counteracted it with, no, that's not right. Let me tell you what the truth is. Let me tell you the truth of Christ. Let me give you an accurate picture. So sometimes there's this uh, propensity to study the enemy and learn the enemy and learn. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of people are really interested in studying about world religions. You know, let me find out what they believe, what they believe, what they believe. You know one of the best ways to guard against false teaching? It's not necessarily to study what everybody else believes, but it's to know for sure what you believe. Know what the Bible says. Know the truth of Christ. And that's kind of what Paul did here. He gave this positive setting forth of the exalted nature, the unmatched glory of Christ. And so Colossians as a letter is proclaiming the absolute supremacy and the sole sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the ironic thing. There is no evidence of Paul being the one who planted this church. There is also no evidence that Paul had ever physically visited this church. So you might think, okay, why is he writing him a letter? Because Paul was an apostle. Paul was a leader, a teacher, a missionary, an evangelist. He was an eyewitness of a resurrected Jesus. He had spiritual authority. He also had a tie to this church because of a gentleman named Epaphras who had come to visit Paul and Timothy in prison and told them about the church. So he had received some information and so in his capacity as a spiritual leader, a spiritual authority of the day, he wrote a letter to them to help them with this trouble, this challenge of false teaching. So, what do we see in these first eight verses? Well, I'm going to try not to... I'm going to try to talk fast but not abbreviate too much in the time we have, okay? So, so listen quickly, and I'm going to try to speak quickly. There's two things in this text. The first two verses are a paragraph. Verses 3 through 8 are a paragraph. So we're going to kind of look at those divisions and what they tell us. First of all, Paul greets the spiritual family. Paul greets the spiritual family. Verses 1 and 2. Paul's an apostle, as we already discussed, but look what he says about his position. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So, what does that tell us? It means Paul is a leader, a teacher, an evangelist, a missionary, an eyewitness of a resurrected Jesus. But it's also a position that he did not put himself in by the will of God. So we have to understand, Paul was placed in in this capacity. He didn't lobby for it. He didn't run for an office. He didn't try to get enough um, support from those in a community. He was put in this position by God. If, if you remember Acts chapter 9, he's on the road to Damascus. God kind of took over that situation. Okay, So go back and read the story. It's pretty dramatic. But Paul was on his way to kill some Christians. He wasn't on his way to preach Jesus. But God turned him around. That's his story. That's his testimony. By the will of God. He's appointed not by the will of man, but by the will of God. Timothy, it says, is with him in this prison. Timothy, our brother. So what does that mean? Our brother. That's spiritual family. He doesn't say, Timothy, my brother. He says, Timothy, our brother. He's writing to a church filled with Christians. And he's talking about our brother. So there's a spiritual family. Now that's the... That's the theme here. Welcome to the family. Okay, so, so I want you to listen through that lens. Uh, try to understand the implications of a spiritual family. Now the church at Colossae is a family. Because look what he says in verse 2. To the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. Now what is a saint? Saints are holy people 
a title for God's people that applied in some context to a small group seen as the most dedicated ones. But saints are followers of Jesus. Some denominations, some faith traditions tend to elevate that title, that status, and make it something that is unbiblical. Let me just say that. It's unbiblical. A saint, if you're a Christian, you're a saint. Plain and simple. Now, whatever culture adds to that, I'm not responsible. This is what the Bible says. Saints, followers of Jesus. What about faithful brethren? We're talking about trustworthy, dependable brothers and sisters, faithful brethren in Christ. Faithful brethren in Christ. Douglas Moo, who's a a great New Testament scholar, he said this word, brethren, this word was apparently widely used in the ancient world within various associations to stress, listen to this, the intimacy of relationship within these associations. Members called one another Adelphos, brethren. It's a uh, sometimes translated brothers, but it's brethren, brothers and sisters, as a way of indicating the association was like a second home. Because this language is so common in the New Testament, you could easily overlook the significance. But it reminds us that we are members of the same family and we should adopt the attitudes and actions necessary to maintain our family unity. That's a church, y'all. That's a church. That's what a church is supposed to be. It's a spiritual family. It's a second home. That's who Paul is addressing here. Saints and faithful brethren in Christ who were at Colossae. And then what is the initial uh, introduction? Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Grace is unmerited favor and blessing of God. Peace is wholeness, soundness, even spiritual prosperity. But then, what's the qualifier? Grace to you and peace from God our Father. You wonder where we receive blessings like this. It's from God. Grace and peace. God is the source of all good things. So Paul is greeting the spiritual family. Number two. And, ironically, finally, number two. Paul is expressing love for the spiritual family. Love, care, concern. Remember, there's no evidence that he started the church. There's no evidence that he had physically visited the church. But, does that prevent him from having a spiritual, godly love and concern for these brothers and sisters? No, it does not. You know why? What's the song say? Blessed be the tie that binds. What does it bind? Our hearts in Christian love. Where do you think people come up with these lyrics? They didn't make it up. They didn't make it up. Paul has genuine love for his spiritual family. Look what he says beginning in verse 3. And and this is, the words are so important here. We give thanks to God. Who, Who is God? Keep reading. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They have the same Father. You see the pronoun? Our. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God. We're praying always for you. That means they're lifting up this family of God in prayer. But look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, since we heard of the love which you have for all the saints, so we are praying for you always because you are part of the spiritual family to which we also belong, and we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, we've heard of the love you have for all the saints. Where did you get that stuff? Where did you get this faith And this love. Let's keep reading verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. 
So there's hope laid up for you in heaven. That's where this faith and love came from. You previously heard of this hope in the word of truth. Well, what's the word of truth? Gospel. It's the truth about Jesus. Douglas Moo again writes, faced with teaching that led them to wonder whether Christ could supply all their spiritual needs, the Colossians need to be reminded that their present experience of faith and love rests on the solid foundation of what God has committed to do for them in the future. That's hope. We're hoping in what God has in store for His people. So, Paul, along with Timothy, Paul's the writer, Timothy's kind of there, moral support, a, a fellow servant. But Paul says to this church, whom he has most likely never met, we're giving thanks to God. We're praying for you always. We've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. We've heard of the love you have for all the saints. And it's because you have hope laid up in heaven for you. And you heard about this hope through the word of truth, which is the gospel. And the gospel has come to you. Now look what he says about the gospel in verse 6. The gospel is constantly bearing fruit and increasing in all the world. And it's been doing that in this city of Colossae since the day they heard and understood the grace of God in truth. So, what is this gospel message? What kind of influence does this gospel message have? Well, apparently, it's worldwide. Apparently, the grace of God in truth, apparently the, the love of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the death and resurrection and then ascension of Christ, that story has been moving. And when, did, when did Paul write this letter? 30 years after those events, right? What's been going on in those 30 years? Have you read the book of Acts? The Holy Spirit came down. The apostles were empowered. Do you remember Acts chapter 1 and verse 8? It's not for you to know times and seasons that are fixed by the Father's authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, guess what? In 30 years, that's been happening. This gospel has been increasing and bearing fruit. In, in where? In all the world. It's come to you, but just as in all the world, in verse 6, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember the day you heard the gospel? Do you remember when you first heard about Jesus? And maybe not first heard the word name or name Jesus, but I'm talking about first really heard about Jesus. Do you remember? Now, if you remember, let me ask you another question. Did it make a difference in your life? Has it influenced you at all? Are your thoughts or your attitudes or your beliefs or perspectives or your actions, your life, your lifestyle, are those things affected at all since you've heard of Jesus? The gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world also it constantly is bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard and understood the grace of God in Christ. Do you know what the gospel is really about in simple terms? I mean, you can go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. You can read the, the simple gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. 
You can go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, well actually verse 1 through 10, and, and you can read, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were following the prince of the power of the air. We were giving in to the desires of our heart, just like the sons of disobedience, like the rest of the world. But God, because of His great love, His mercy that He had toward us, even when we were dead, Christ has made us alive. You can read on to verse 8. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can see the message of the gospel, you can understand, but you have to understand it at a, a deeper level to see really, is there an influence? Because the Bible says in verse 6, bearing fruit and increasing constantly, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard and understood the grace of God in truth. So the, has, has the gospel come? The gospel is, is present. Has it come to you? Has the gospel come to you individually? Have you heard it? Have you understood the grace of God in truth? Have you, have you understood what this table means? Have you understood what that cross signifies? Have you understood the truth of Jesus? That's really the question here because I'm going to tell you a secret that's not a secret. When it says, welcome to the family, you talk about a spiritual family, if you're not in Jesus, you're not in the family. If you have not trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life, if you've not surrendered to Him, believed, confessed, surrendered, then you're not in the family. And that's not a judgment, that's just a simple observation. Well, why does that even matter? Well, thank you for asking. The reason why it matters is because if we're not in the family, then that means every second of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, as we go about our business, our routine, and we get distracted, and we're not thinking about spiritual things, we're just going about our day, every moment that you are not in Christ, there is a certain wrath and judgment that is hanging over you that will fall upon you the moment you breathe your last breath unless you are in Christ. Again, is that... That's not a judgment. That's not a, a fear tactic. That is simply the truth that we all need to be aware of as we continue on in life. Because if for some reason, through whatever input or influence, we have believed that we have plenty of time to deal with spiritual things, and i got other things going on right now, I don't, need to mess, I don't have time to mess with that right now, I'll deal with that when I'm later. You know, when I'm older, when, it, when it's later in life. I, I had a, a, a person tell me one time, we were talking about, uh, I, I assumed this person was a Christian, the way we were talking, and uh, talking about mission uh, opportunities and, you know, going here or there with the gospel and being involved in this trip or this project or those types of things. And, and he literally told me, with all seriousness, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to do that once, I'm, once I am retired. And I'm not working. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, then I'm going to look into that. So, okay, so God don't want you to do any of that now. You would just go ahead about your life and do whatever you want and work. And, uh, and once you're 65 and retire, then, okay, then you can go tell people about Jesus. Okay? What if you don't live that long? Because you have a crystal ball. Do you know the future? Because he was about 40 when we had this conversation. I'm like, okay, well, that's nice. Why don't you just look in whatever source you got going there? Why don't you just look and tell me what's going on in my life so I can make some plans too? Because, you know, the Bible I read tells me that God knows every day ordained for me 
But I didn't know. I, I knew that. I didn't know I could know that. Because I thought we were supposed to just take the gospel and tell people about Jesus. I mean, maybe I'm naive, but that's, I thought that's what we were supposed to do. I thought that's what the Great Commission said, that we're supposed to be telling people about Jesus. We're supposed to be part of this. The gospel has gone to all the world. It's constantly bearing fruit and increasing, just like it's doing for these brothers and sisters in this church. How did they hear it? Verse 7, verse 8. They learned the gospel from Epaphras. And this is a brother that's rarely, maybe twice in this letter and maybe in Philemon, because Colossians and Philemon are very close together in their message and, and uh, time of writing. But we don't know a lot about him, but we do know this. Apparently, in verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras. So apparently he's a spiritual leader of some sort. He's a teacher. He knows the gospel because he taught it to this church. So he's a fellow brother in the family. And look how he's described by Paul. Beloved Fellow bond servant. I love this word. It's one of my favorite Greek words ever. Doulos. Bond servant. Almost a slave. And in this particular context, soon doulos, which means fellow bond servant, which means we're all bond servants. Epaphras is our beloved. That word beloved comes from the word agape. Love. Unselfish. Sacrificial. Our beloved fellow bond servant. He's also a faithful servant of Christ on behalf of Paul and Timothy. Different word here. Servant. In the second half of verse 7, he's a beloved fellow bond servant, but he's also a faithful servant. That word's diakonos, where we get our word deacon, which means minister. So he's not just a servant, he's also a minister. He's serving, ministering to the church on behalf of Paul and Timothy ministering to the people of God. And he also, in verse 8, he informed Paul and Timothy about the love of the church which is enabled by the Holy Spirit. The love, see how it's phrased there? Verse 8, your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras has brought messages to them about the church, from the church, because he's involved. So that's what Paul has done here in these first eight verses. He's greeted them as a spiritual family. He's expressed love and care and prayer and concern for his spiritual family. So so what here's here's how we conclude, okay? I know, I know. Let me let me just do this. Let me just do this. All right, so we're good now, right? How do we apply this? Are we a spiritual family? All right, that was the easy one. Are we functioning as a spiritual family? And slightly related to that, are we functioning as a healthy spiritual family? You see the characteristics demonstrated in this text? Here's how Paul and Timothy interact with this spiritual family they hadn't even met much less spent time with them this is how they interact we give thanks to god he's the father of our our lord jesus christ we're praying always for you because we've heard of your faith in christ we've heard of your love for all the saints because we know as you do you have a hope laid up in heaven for you which you learned about when you heard and understood the gospel, the grace of God in Christ, the truth of that message. And we've heard that you you have love in the Spirit. So we know you've learned the gospel, you've been taught the gospel, and the hope of Christ is the foundation of your love and your faith for one another. So are we, are we, do we look like that? Do we have some room for improvement? Everybody does. But how are we doing? 
that's the, the self-evaluation from this text today. How are we doing with that? How is our family, our spiritual family, how are we doing with these types of perspectives and beliefs and actions? Do we know? Are we conscious of the hope that's laid up for us in heaven? And not just conscious of it, but is that foremost in our hearts and minds? That hope we have laid up in heaven, does it then inspire us to have deeper, more active, vibrant faith in Christ Jesus? And does that inspire us to exhibit more love for the saints, for the family? Do we know the Gospel? And I don't mean know the Gospel, I mean know the Gospel. Because I will tell you this, and this is just a side note. I believe that if you profess, listen, listen very closely to what I'm about to say, I don't want anybody to misunderstand this. I believe if you profess to be a believer, follower of Jesus Christ, then that means by necessity you must have at least enough of a knowledge and understanding of the gospel to be able to tell someone else about it. If you can't look at another person and even in the simplest terms explain the gospel of Christ to another person, then I would examine myself and say, do I really know the gospel? Am I a Christian? Because if I, can't, if I don't know it well enough to tell somebody, how could I possibly know it well enough to believe it? Yeah, does that make sense? If I say that I have believed in Jesus and He has changed my life and, and forgiven my sins and bought my eternity, if I say that, but I can't explain the simplest gospel message to another person, that does not add up. Y'all all right? Everybody okay? I'm sorry, I just got a little something happened. The gospel is the foundation, not just of our faith, but of everything we do for Christ. If we can't share that, if we can't articulate that to some degree, something is wrong. Because that is, by the way, the main uh, reason for the existence of the church. We exist. It's not just a function. It's the function. We exist to make disciples of all nations. We are in existence to carry the gospel of Christ everywhere. To tell. To show. It's like... Elementary school, all over, is show and tell. We're supposed to demonstrate the gospel. We're supposed to tell the gospel. St. Francis made this quote so famous all those years ago. Always preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Guess what? It's all, listen, it's always necessary to use words. Always, no exception. I can, listen, I am not good enough of a Christian... To just live right and have people, oh, he must believe in Jesus. They're not going to make the connection. I'm not that good a Christian. i got to say something. Because then I have to say, oh, by the way, yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe in Jesus, I'm following Him, but man, I mess up all the time. And that's why Jesus is so awesome, because He knows I'm going to mess up and He forgives me. He knows I'm not good enough. Eric, I don't know what to say. On that cross, He was good enough for all of us. We don't have to be good enough. But we do have to follow. We do have to trust. We have to believe. And then we have to tell. That, that's what a family does. That's, that's how we love each other. We tell the gospel. Let me pray.